we talked about uh, Julia here and the Scout Mindset, which is a terrific book. So Julia is a, is a core part of the early effective altruism movement. And she was talking about Spock, and Spock does not seem to be very well calibrated. So he says all kinds of predictions about uh, highly likely, but then it doesn't really happen. So these two uh, here are very, very off. And this is based very much on the work of this guy. So this is uh, a Tetlock, Philip Tetlock, who wrote, wrote this with Dan Gardner. And he spent his entire career, which is a very prolific career, uh, a lot of articles that came out, uh, many other topics, but in the last decade or two, mostly about forecasting, um, to write this book, 2015 Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction. And it seems like, so we had a prediction about how people make predictions, and we thought that maybe experts are better predictors. We thought maybe scientists, scholars are better predictors, maybe CAA agents are better predictors. But Tetlock said we should put this to the test. So he developed a platform that allows people to make predictions, and he wanted to track over time who makes more accurate predictions. And he came to some astounding conclusions. And he identified the super forecasters that are able to make accurate predictions. So we'll start with this and I'll slowly build the argument that we can get better at predictions. And this impacts almost everything that we do in this world, from individual decisions and choices to policy, climate change, country level, politics so forth. So let's hear it from him. Is that what makes a good forecaster is really how you think. And can you talk a little bit about what do you mean by that and what are some of the unifying characteristics of super forecasters? Well, it, it, when you ask people in the political world who has good judgment, the answer typically is people who think like me. So liberals tend to think that liberals have good judgment and if you have good forecasting judgment and conservatives tend to think that they're better at it. Um, it, it turns out to be the case that, that uh, forecast, good forecast, forecasting accuracy is not very closely associated with, 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 with ideology. There's a slight tendency for people who are the super forecasters uh, to be uh, more moderate and, and less ideological. Um, but there, there are lots of super forecasters who have strong opinions. Uh, what distinguishes super forecasters is their ability to put aside their opinions, at least temporarily, and just focus on accuracy. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a very demanding exercise for people. We know virtually nothing about the forecasting track records of famous pundits because famous pundits uh, virtually never make falsifiable forecasts. Uh, they say something might happen or could happen or may very well happen. But when I say something could happen, uh, that mean, doesn't mean a lot. Uh, I mean, it could be that it could happen that uh, we're all going to be vaporized by an asteroid in the next 24 hours, or it could be that the sun will rise tomorrow. That uh, could subsume an enormous range of possible probabilities. So if I say something could happen and it does happen, I can say to my readers, well, you know, I told you it could. And if I say something could happen and it doesn't happen, I can come back to my readers and say, well, I just said it could. One of the interesting things about super forecasters is how opportunistic they are. Super forecasters uh, think quite strategically about when it makes sense to invest effort in thinking. So if you wanted to predict the outcome of the presidential election in early October 2015, the 2016 presidential election, um, how would you go about it if you were a super forecaster? A super forecaster wouldn't uh, look carefully at the presidential debates and look into the eyes of the candidates and see which one uh, looks more presidential. Uh, at, at some point in the process, a super forecaster might do that. But a super forecaster would tend to take, start with more the outside view and gradually work in rather than start at the inside and work out. So they would ask very general questions initially like, well, let's look at elections, all presidential elections since World War II, how likely is a Democrat or Republican to win? Or they might say, um, after, the, after the one party has held the presidency for two terms, how likely is there to be a transition? Uh, or they might say, if economic growth is less than 2% uh, then the, in the three quarters before the presidential election, uh, does that bode ill for the uh, party that controls the presidency? Uh, so they would start off with these more general um, 
estimates, these more outside view estimates, and then they would gradually adjust in response to estimates about the po popularity polls of candidates, which are notoriously volatile at this stage of the, of the process. Uh, but they would, they would take them into account, but they would discount them some considerably because they are so volatile. And, they would, and then they would adjust incrementally. So um, the best forecasters, I think, in the, over the course of 2015, have somewhat lowered their probability estimates of Hillary Clinton being the next president of the United States. I think they started off significantly above 50 percent, and there's been some significant hemorrhaging of those, of those estimates. But nothing all that dramatic. I mean, the interesting thing about super forecasters is they're very patient and they make granular belief updates. So they don't suddenly say, oh my God, the latest email scandal, or is Biden going to come into the race, or is this or that. Um, there are these little clues, and they don't, it, it's not that they ignore them, but they tend to respond very incrementally to them. Uh, so it, it may be the probability that, of Hillary Clinton becoming the next president of the United States moves from 45% to 43% in response to an inspector general report in the State Department, that sort of thing. So the best forecasters tend not to make it onto television. Uh, they're not very attractive to the TV producers because they're much more likely to say, on the one hand, on the other hand, and then now we have to strike some kind of integrated balance. And uh, that apparently doesn't make very good television. Yeah, a bit like academics. It's complicated. There's this, there's that, you know. But if you want to have headlines that you need somebody to tell you this is what's going to happen and make a big uh, uh, forecast. So he's the one who uh, started with this uh, calibration and put this into uh, the book. And you can see. Um, so here we have the we have the underconfidence that goes above the line. And then we have overconfidence that goes uh, below the line. And then we have these two models. So it could be some people who just like put everything between 40 and 60. They're like, you know, we don't know, we don't know. So this is definitely well calibrated, but it's very, very cautious. It seems like the, the ones that seem to have the most impact are the ones that are decisive. So they can uh, put high, high probabilities and then they get that right. But when they don't know something, they also put that aside. So the tricky part is to really be uh, not only calibrated, but also move from uh, just saying, you know, 50-50 chance, I don't know if I know, to uh, being more confident in your confidence. So knowing how calibrated you are and being able to make uh, predictions based on, on that. So this is an example for a super forecaster. And uh, as you can see over here, this is the, the trend regarding uh, one, you know, certain prediction that they have. So let's say they start from something relatively close to uh, 50%. You know, they have a bit, uh, a bit higher than that. And then, as you can see, there's no dramatic shifts. It's not like moving from, you know, 70 to 30, going up, going down. They just slowly adjust a little bit up, a little bit up, a little bit up, then down, then down, go up, go, go down. And then you can see these very uh, small dots going all the way to the top until they have 100% certainty. So... What you can see here is a process of updating. So it's not like every little detail that comes uh, out um, changes your views on something. You have solid, consistent views with updating a little bit up, a little bit down, which helps you to get closer to the truth based on little events. So you have the overall uh, picture. It does seem like it's above 50%, but then your confidence in that updates regarding the evidence that you have. So this is the section starts off very slightly, change uh, forecast 34 different times. Uh, this, how small uh, this uh, super forecast team changes are, no dramatic swings, and then uh, it goes up, goes down 3.5%. Uh, so I think this is very different to how some people uh, react. So for example, if you invest in the stock market and there's something big that's happening, immediately a lot of people are very vulnerable and I'm not, not good at, uh, at investing, uh, immediately say, so I'm going to put all my money in or I'm going to take all my money out. But this is, uh, of course, too late to the game because other big banks or big investors have already made the money on that uh, increase or decrease. So there's just like a lot of biases that come into play and super forecasters ignore those or are able to overcome those with very small updates up and down based on what's happening uh, in, in the market. So these are the 10 commandments, so-called, of what it means to be a super forecaster. Uh, and I just like 
put the ones that I think are the most important in red. So from a philosophical outlook, you need to be cautious, humble, and non-deterministic. Uh, so I like the cautious and humble, and I think it relates to some of the things that you uh, raised over here. And then uh, actively open-minded, intelligent, and knowledgeable. You know, there's not a lot that you can say about this. It depends on how much time you have and a few core things within you, like intelligence is pretty fixed throughout the lifetime. So you, you have what you have. Reflective and numerous, that's good. But I think um, actively open-minded, um, believing that hypotheses are to be tested and not treasures to be protected is something that's very important. Uh, generally, adopting a scientist's mindset is an important thing uh, in being a super uh, forecaster. I mean, pragmatic, analytical, uh, dragonfly-eyed, values, diverse views, probabilistic, uh, thoughtful updaters, and good intuitive psychologists. So, of course, I like good intuitive psychology because after a while, you develop some intuitions about what might happen and what might not. It's not like I'm a much bigger expert than the we've seen that even Kahneman and Dorothy Bishop make uh, mistakes, but we're much more careful about things and cautious about our ability to really um, overcome these biases, uh, a lot of humility. And then at the end, these two, growth mindset and grit, um, yeah, people talk about these things as important, and uh, Tetlock at least uh, thinks that, that this comes into play here based on the research that he's, that he's done. So somebody on Twitter just like a few days ago kind of summarized the Tetlock uh, matrix, um, moving from stage one to stage two to stage uh, three, where the uh, super forecaster is an autonomous elite near perfection forecaster about uh, moving from uh, something superficial about causality. So X leads to, to Y, just like everything seems like X leads to Y. The correlation implies causation. So ov obviously this has problems to moving to just being able to integrate a lot of things into uh, a model. Other, you know, starting from being stuck in my own views and then moving to a nuanced a weighting of inside and outside views. So what I believe in and what I know is important, but I will uh, take into account the experts, the prediction models, the politics, the uh, whatever it is that's happening out there. Um, and then also integrating new information, so updating little by little and not letting um, small small pieces of information affect your overall, overall model. Um, back to Julia Galef who uh, did the Scott Mindset. So she has a few chapters where she talks about forecasting and how this relates to the effective altruism movement and how we can do some more good. She hosted a few uh, sessions in the, various, um, in the various conferences for effective altruism. And this is from her book. So what made the super forecasters super? It wasn't that they were smarter than anybody, else, everybody else. It wasn't that they had more knowledge or experience than everybody else. Uh, these were mostly amateurs. They outperformed even the CIA professional analysts. And uh, what made the super forecasters so great at being right was that they were great at being wrong. So in almost everything in life, it's good to have the capacity to be wrong. So if you ask me about uh, what... Uh, possible differences, cultural differences I see when I come to giving uh, classes in Hong Kong is that I think Hong Kong students are very worried about being wrong. Also very worried about telling the professor that they're wrong, even though it's very clear that sometimes the professor is wrong. Just generally mistakes are associated with, I think, losing face, losing confidence in yourself. But uh, I think it's one of my greatest abilities. I make a lot of mistakes. Um, and it's about not only admitting to your mistakes, but even being able to communicate those and overcome those uh, with others. So if you can learn anything in this course, <laughs> let it be this, that it's okay to make mistakes. Plus, um, a lot of my friends, uh, colleagues, fa fa family to some extent, extended family, are entrepreneurs. Israel has a very vibrant startup culture, a uh, little bit of a Silicon Valley. So I know a lot of startupists, and it's very clear that in order to make it big and have an exit, you have to fail a few times, and you need to come prepared that you're going to be able to fail. So it's completely okay to fail. 
this is why you have in a capitalist society, you have some ways that would prevent you from losing money. So there's bankruptcy and there's all sorts of protections for you to be able to take risks. So coming in and saying, it's all or nothing. If I fail one time, I have to let it go. So entrepreneurs who are successful and get to the exit and are able to sell their company or are able to grow big are ones that have tried again and again and uh, failed throughout that, but they did not let failure um, prevent them from, from trying again. They learn from that and they improve for the next, for the next time. So this is her uh, summary of the whole thing. Change your mind a little every time. Recognize that you were wrong makes you better at being right. Uh, not just admitting your mistake, but also updating. So uh, owning up to the fact that you made a mistake, recognizing what was the mistake, and then what led to that mistake so you don't make that mistake or similar mistakes in the future. And I really like this. And this is all the summary of what a scout mindset is. If you're not changing your mind, you're doing something wrong. So I think coming in, even as a professor to a class and saying, I know everything because I'm the professor and you're the students, there is nothing that I can learn from you. It's just the wrong way of approaching life in general. So in every discussion, in every interaction that I have, it doesn't matter who the person is, what their background, but their rank is. I just assume that there's something for me to uh, learn from that. And I think this is the basics of the scout mindset that she is trying to promote. At least here, it has a um, very strong association with uh, being a super forecaster and being able to do well with this. Finally, for, from uh, the book, uh, how do we get better at accuracy? How do we become super uh, forecasters? Generally in life, it's important for us. So at the beginning, there's like uh, already the super forecasters. So this is the regular forecaster that doesn't really do very well, but then you can become adopting all these things that we talked about and all these skills over here. But then there's something that pushes you uh, higher a little bit. So you can do some training and that adds uh, 10%. So you can improve your skill by learning from others. So Tetlock, Julia, give a lot of workshops on how to train yourself to have this kind of thing. But then one big factor that you can do that is as important is teaming. This is why in this course we do everything as teams. Hopefully this leads to synergy and correcting each other's uh, work. But sometimes, of course, it can backfire. But if you make everything open, if you get everybody to go over things, if you get people to collaborate well together based on some uh, contract and understanding, aligned expectations, then teaming can uh, boost you with 10% more. And then if you aggregate all sorts of algorithms, tools that we have, we'll talk about some AI AIs and how well that they do, then you can get much closer to uh, you know, the, the best possible um, forecasting. So what does forecasting uh, look like? So the guy that was kicked out and was uh, running for elections again yesterday was Netanyahu. Will Netanyahu be the next prime minister of Israel? So you can see how this starts off with about like a 50-50 prediction. But then over time, you can see the ups and downs, uh, he going up, going down. And this actually works with real, real money. So just like the stock market, you can buy stocks in your prediction. So if you're a good super forecaster, you can actually make really good money because some of these platforms, for example, Meta Forecast, allow you to buy stocks in your predictions. So... The good thing about this is that if you're a very bad forecaster, you're going to lose money and be kicked out of the system. So at the end, what you get over here is that you have people who are very good forecasters because uh, you know survival, survival of the fittest or the strongest predictors here on these platforms. Another, so this is from Polymarket over here. Meta Clios is, uh, I think, the biggest platform. And the one that is uh, the most successful that I've seen so far does amazing things. So I was looking at Yeshatid was the current um, or, you know, for the last uh, year or so, uh, formed the coalition. Is it going to win or not win uh, the election is yesterday? You can see how it goes up and goes down. And then you have these two contenders, so the Likud party, which is Netanyahu, and then you have Yeshatid, which is the... Um, the, the one that uh, threw him out a year and a half ago. 
Um, so what you can see here is that generally over time, Netanyahu went up and went up uh, all the way till yesterday. And then here, this bounced up and down. So it was a very, very close elections. All of the polls were about 50-50%. Wasn't clear where this is going to go. But uh, interestingly, the prediction here was very clear. And the prediction here was quite clear. So likely 60%. Unlikely that they contend that the current um, government is going to stay. And finally, I can tell you that the result was what? <laughs> what was the result? In accordance to these uh, predictions, the uh, Netanyahu became the prime minister with a very, what seems to be like a very big coalition. So a very strong comeback for, for Netanyahu. So it was really interesting for me to put aside all the news because you can go mad <laughs> with the news. Like what's happening with the news? This newspaper is affiliated with this uh, part of the, you know, the coalition or the opposition. If you track the newspapers, it's very difficult to get an accurate assessment of what is going on. But sometimes following these trends on the forecasting platforms gives you a much better understanding. Plus there's comments. So people share what it is that they know or not know or the sources of information. Some of them have blogs or YouTube channels. So tracking the super forecasters is really interesting to see how they update their models. So rather than this poll said this and this poll said that, uh, sometimes it's much better for us to just go to these platforms who uh, that seem to, to have a very uh, good ability to, to predict things uh, for, for the election. So they did a, a good job for the very difficult um, prediction of who is going to win the Israeli elections uh, yesterday. Nice thing about this platform, which is the leading one, I'll show you what this looks like. is that to the forecasters, they show uh, a certain, so they show the median and they show the mean and they show some distribution, but then they run their own algorithms and they keep track of their own predictions. And right now it seems like their ability to predict is very surprisingly well calibrated. So a little bit underconfident, but for the most part, this seems to be a very well calibrated. So, if you see something by the platform that says 40%, it does seem like very likely that this is going to be 40%. 100% very, seems very likely 100%. So this is as close as we can possibly, I think, get to uh, well ca uh, calibrated. And this is an aggregation by the platform of all the super forecasters. So let's say, for example, in the EA community, you want to know something about the future. You don't know what's going to happen with global warming. You can put this in that platform, get the super forecasters to work on this, get the platform to do its algorithm, and then with very high probability, it's going to happen. So rather than treating the future as an unknown, suddenly in the past five, 10 years, we've developed tools that based on both humans and machines together, we can get to a very accurate calibration. So something that seems completely impossible for us to predict. And I remember in our course, we had a, many times people saying, but we can't, we don't know this. It seems so far away. We have no idea. This is high uncertainty. Now we have tools for that. So I'll show you a little bit about that and then how it's used for uh, effective altruism. Yeah, so they keep a, a very close, um, you know, detailed record of how this platform uh, does and you can go for each one of the predictions and and go for so for example here will John McPhee receive a prison term of at least three years um, so you can just like go and click on any one of those and then see uh, the predictions over time and how the platform did and how individual uh, researchers did so for example Tokyo Olympics you can see what this looks like how it went up and down over time um, regarding the, which is going to be the most successful Olympic team at the Tokyo Olympics. Total predictions, forecasters, community prediction, and then the platform's prediction. It seems like at least the platform, uh, is, they're usually very close to each other, but the platform usually uh, does slightly better than uh, the community. And then you can just like see all kinds of uh, waiting, uniform, recent, have a, have a look at uh, also some of the, the comments that are made on this 
And then finally, um, the forecasters, uh, you have rankings and you can see who are the best forecaster, forecasters and their level. And some of these uh, forecasters take pride in this. It's a, it's a branding. They take pride in their ability to, to forecast and they give uh, workshops on this. So everybody trains one another on how they make forecasters. And what's nice about this, and I think Tetlock was talking about this, is in order to succeed in a platform like this, you can't just say, maybe it will happen, most likely it will happen. Here you need to make a very precise assessment of how uh, accurate you are, if this is going to happen or not happen. So you put your reputation and you put your uh, confidence and your accuracy to the test every time. So people who are like this, who dominate this, you know, 72,000, you can't cheat this platform because it does everything in advance. There's no way for you to do something that nobody else is doing. So these people are, are doing something uh, very special and we need to learn from them. So this is like core social psychology, applying psychology to social problems, to the world, to the future. Uh, really some, some amazing things. And you have tournaments every once in a while. So the Ukraine conflict, what's going to happen with this biosecurity? Is there going to be a nuclear war? People are like worried about this. What are the implications? If I read the newspaper, somebody is going to tell me this, going to tell me that. Different countries have different things on this. So it's a, uh, it's interesting, and and there's an ability to make money. It doesn't cost you anything. You can just like participate, and then you can. Um, some people do do some good money out of this, and are very well calibrated. So you have different prediction tournaments. You can go into the individual questions, and then take part in this. 300 people, 162 people, 463 people. So um, I think this is fascinating. Like if I had time, I would definitely train myself uh, in this and take part in, in, in all of that. <clears throat> all right, so let's see. Yeah, the people who created this, this is how they explain the platform. Nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. So I think Elon Musk's real worry is that uh, somebody will develop an artificial intelligence that is just really, really superior oh, to what everybody else in the world has. And if one organization, whether it's a company or a country or an individual in their basement, has a system like this, it grants a huge amount of power. want to affect the future, it would really help to know what that future is going to be like. How are things going to unfold? We created a, a platform where crowds of people could get together and make predictions about uh, science and technological issues. What you can do is see which people that make predictions are right over and over and over again. Which are the experts who really know what they're doing? And then in the future, you can say, OK, let's take those people, what predictions they made about this question, and take that seriously. In the longer term, of course, you do have to think about if AIs really get equivalent to humans or better across a wide variety of disciplines, then there's a real question of what does anybody do? You know, do we just have fun and play games all day? Uh, is there anything worthwhile or meaningful left to do? And I think that's a, a big question that nobody has real answers to. So these platforms are a revolution and we can learn a lot from that. We need to know how to use those. We need to embed those more in our decision-making. Uh, right now, they're addressing all sorts of things that seem to be more policy or technology, but there are some of those that also can help address individual decision-making. 
for me in my work with uh, HKU students doing the mass replications and extensions uh, project, I was uh, always very curious whether people can predict the replicability of, of findings, whether they have the intuition of what works and what doesn't work, because there's a lot of literature out there and we can't do replications for everything. So some social psychologists, for example, came out with this uh, platform. So this is, uh, you know, published in science, predict science to improve science by improving the interpretation of research results, uh, mitigating bias against non-results and improving predictive accuracy, fighting what we saw that is prominent, hindsight bias, outcome bias, overcoming some of these by having a prediction platform that is focused on social science findings. So for example, if you're planning a thesis and you want to know I mean, just going to waste uh, one year of my uh, life doing something that is completely meaningless. If you're doing a PhD, five years of your life, perhaps it's better for you first to go on this platform and see whether the predictors in that platform think that this is going to replicate, if this is trustworthy or not. And it seems like some of them are very well calibrated. So I use this sometimes. I didn't have this when I was doing my postdoc. I needed to decide what to do. I based things on my own intuition. I think judgment decision-making is definitely more credible than, let's say, social priming. But I didn't have hardcore evidence for that. These forecasters also don't have. They have more um, evidence than I did. But based on what they know and based on what they've seen and based on the patterns of predictions, you can look at this platform, put your question into the test, have people predict this and, and then see uh, what happens in order to uh, adjust what you're going to do your thesis on, what you're going to base your research on. It's not necessarily just for academic, but if uh, you're going into industry and you want to know, should I do this intervention? Is this going to help my patients? Should I implement this at my school? Is this really trustworthy? Is this credible? You can use platforms like this in order to put your predictions, get some insights, and then aggregate this in order to know whether to move in a direction or not, even before you have any evidence. So I urge you to uh, go have a look. So she's giving a, a really nice talk over here in EA Global. So social psychologists are communicating with the effective altruism community all the time, introducing this platform and trying to see how the effective altruism movement and the social psychologists with prediction markets and forecasting can align with one another. Lots of papers came out on this. Uh, can futures market safe science, prediction markets for, for science? So looking at different publications, gambling safe, safe science in order to predict whether something is going to replicate or not. And then they give rewards for accuracy. So people had the, the incentive in order to try and predict things uh, well. And as you can see, we even ran this on the stuff that I uh, did with uh, HKU students. So all the replications are here. You can see what happens, how many votes we got for each one of those. So around 90, 100 for each, uh, predicting the success and failure rates. And then finally, uh, was our uh, replication successful or not successful? And then whether this was well calibrated or not. So for, for the most part, it was quite well calibrated. And you can see over here that this is actually paid prediction markets. So the economists in Sweden ran prediction markets on HKU students' replications, which is quite remarkable because this is really a model that would allow them to better calibrate without doing replications. What is the likelihood that things are going to be replicated successfully if somebody would run this or not? And it's fascinating because if you click on any one of these <clears throat> in, the, in the markets, you can see the ups and downs, you can see who the super forecasters are, how did they make this kind of decision? Why did they update their information? And doing this on your own work, this is amazing because it also helps you inform, improve yourself, and then make decisions about what you want to replicate further in the future. So you can take many of the scientific models also with social psychology and implement this for forecasting and prediction markets in order to gain some insights for the entire community. This year, um, started last year, the American, the US, ARPA put a lot of money, millions of dollars to say, okay, we need to solve this for once and for all. So they uh, funded uh, 3,000 replications plus prediction markets. 
trying to understand in economics across the social sciences, the exact sciences, to see um, what people think about the um, success rate of a replication. And then they had teams trying to replicate this. So HKU, I think, uh, replication, I think is one of the largest that we've seen. We have like 120. So this is a big one in judgment decision making, but we don't have this for all the disciplines. We have this only for judgment decision making. We need this to be systematic and we also need this to be non. Uh, so, so our, uh, so my choosing of the replication targets was my own choice. So it was not random, but DARPA score, which is this project that they're running has systematically sampled from the different disciplines in order to try and get people to predict that. So if it's random sampling, then it will say something that's uh, likely uh, more, more accurate uh, than ours. Finally, about communicating predictions uh, effectively. Uh, so we really need to keep in mind how we make predictions. So when somebody asks you a question, what is the likelihood of Netanyahu winning the Israeli elections, let's say you were asked two days ago, how should you say your prediction? And if you watch TV, uh, it's very difficult to make sense of what the predictions are because nobody makes an accurate prediction. Everybody makes a prediction that is very difficult to interpret. And this is also a social psychology problem. It's a judgment decision-making problem. So if you remember, Julia Galef gave the example of Spock. She translated his impossible to what she thought, you know, on this calibration, what she thought impossible meant, what very unlikely, what is unlikely, what is likely. So it's uh, even Spock, when he makes predictions to James T. Kirk, James T. Kirk wants to know, should I go for this or not go for this? But then Spock gives him something like impossible. What is impossible? I think that's a little bit stronger. So we have a sense of understanding of perhaps this is like zero percent, but then very unlikely. What is very unlikely? What is the probability of very unlikely? When somebody gives you very unlikely that this is going to happen, is class going to be canceled due to typhoon signal eight? What are, what are the chances? Very unlikely. What does that mean? Is it zero? It's not zero. A little bit above zero. How much more than zero? 10 to 20, okay. What is unlikely? Huh? 20? What's, what's above unlikely between 20 and 50? Slightly likely, unlikely? <laughs> yeah, something like that. So you do slightly and then unlikely and then very unlikely, something like that, yeah. So it's interesting because when we put this to the test, and we should put this to the test. We should ask people, when you hear the word almost certainly, what do you hear? And actually, this was also started with the CIA. So this is a CIA report from 1963, when they realized that when they tell something to the US president, the CIA thinks that this is very likely or unlikely. <laughs> what does the president understand? So they... <laughs> looked at this. I really like this. Somebody did a, a much better uh, way of visualizing this than actual CIA report. So you can look over here on the left. So it seems like with some things we have, you know, almost no chance seems very close to zero. Almost certainly seems very close to 100. But just like look, look at all this distribution, all of these patterns, sometimes some of those are not very clear. Like for example, when the CIA tells the president, we doubt. What's the interpretation? It can go all the way from 10% to 60%. So very difficult to interpret this. So we need to be very cautious when we use words like that, that have a very wide distribution. Likely can be anything from 50% to 90%. Different people have different interpretations of what these things are. So rather than using these numbers, unlikely about even, better than even, just use numerical numbers and also give an estimate of how wrong you might be. So we predict from 60 to 80%, or we predict 60 with this level of, of certainty and give a number behind this. So these are testable because if you use these words, this is not testable. You can't really see whether the prediction is accurate or not. Finally, um, 
a little bit of a question quiz for you. Self-knowledge, you don't need to like, share this uh, with me, but you're very welcome to. Here's an example from going to uh, a test. So I just took a breast cancer here because this is uh, in the book, um, but it could be anything, anything else. So let's say that, for example, um, breast cancer test has 90% uh, accuracy. And a woman patient just tested positive. What is the likelihood that she has breast cancer? So what, how, to, how to make sense of this? So now you know 1% and 90%. How to calculate this? Yeah, complicated stuff, right? And even doctors, even scientists have a very hard time uh, calculating this. So for example, I think this is what you were trying to get at, saying, okay, so let's try and bake this out. So let's say that we have 1,000 women. So 10 out of the 1,000 have breast cancer. And then out of the 10, nine times it's going to test uh, positive. So we have 90% accuracy here. And then for those who don't have breast cancer and they take the test, 99 do not have breast, breast cancer and test positive, so 99. Right. So now we, we broke this out. So this is 90% accuracy. When they mean this, they actually mean this breakout out of the population taking into consideration the base rates, right? Even with this, people have a very hard time computing this. Sounds like you know the, the equations, but even then, how to plug this in? So even if I give this to doctors, what should what should they do with this? <clears throat> So let's say that you want to uh, design the ultimate COVID test pamphlet, that people will know exactly what to include in there so that people will understand how likely is it that they really... So a woman tested positive for breast cancer, and it's only 8% that she really has breast cancer, even though the accuracy is supposedly 90%. We are not intuitive Bayesians when we see things like this. But if you give people this, pamphlet, it seems like they're much better at interpreting this. So one of the things that some people study in social psychology is how to communicate numbers so people can make decisions. How devastating is it if a doctor based on a test that says positive immediately goes to, you know, cut, cut the breasts, do surgery, immediately send the, the woman to surgery. And we need this, we need to know. So even these things can make us uh, misunderstand the world. Even if we're scientists, even if we're doctors, just like bad use of, of statistics. So this is a science paper published in Science, how to visualize uncertainty about the future. So some social psychologists spend a lot of time to just improve the way that we communicate statistics. Even in the EA community, better understanding of probabilities helps us to make better policy, to understand this charity versus this charity not only forecasting, but also being able to compare, compare the two. Okay, let's take a five minute break and then go to a completely different topic of experimental philosophy. This is a very young, enthusiastic, not young in age, but like in terms of uh, recent past 10 years is a revolution of trying to take philosophical notions like free will, like morality. So we've talked a lot about morality, but not in the very philosophical nature of what is morality and how uh, core morality is. So philosophers decided rather than us uh, philosophizing <laughs> about the nature of the universe, let's just ask, ask people what is it that they believe and then make some predictions based on that. So Josh, Josh Nob is going to present experimental philosophy to you followed by Eddie. Uh, both of these are prominent people who started this movement uh, that is a subsection, I would say, or very related to social psychology slash the cognitive, uh, cognitive sciences, trying to make sense of fundamental notions in philosophy. Hi. I'm Joshua Nob from Yale University, and today I'm going to be talking about a new approach to philosophy that is sometimes called 
experimental philosophy. The basic idea behind experimental philosophy is that we might be able to make some philosophical progress by actually going out and running systematic experimental studies, much like the experiments people usually run in social psychology or in cognitive science. Now you might be thinking, how could running a study like that ever help us make any progress in philosophy? After all, philosophy isn't supposed to be about how people ordinarily think. It is supposed to be about figuring out which answers to these questions are actually the right ones. This is definitely exactly the right question to be asking. But experimental philosophers claim that by running these studies, we can get some valuable insight into why people have the thoughts they do. And if we understand why people typically have the thoughts they do, we might be able to get a better sense of whether we should be putting our trust in those thoughts or just dismissing them. There's a lot of controversy about whether this approach can ever actually work, but I thought it might be good just to give you a quick example so that you can make up your mind for yourself. The experimental philosopher Felipe de Brigard recently ran a series of experiments to investigate the way people ordinarily think about a famous philosophical thought experiment called the experience machine. His idea was that if we could get a better understanding of what Sorry, the captions are ahead, so they're very frustrating. What is going on in our minds when we hear this thought experiment, we might be in a better position to figure out whether our thoughts about it are correct or incorrect. Now, the experience machine thought experiment goes like this. Imagine that in the future, there are super duper neuroscientists, and these neuroscientists are able to create a machine that can stimulate your brain in such a way that you think you're having a truly amazing life. So if you enter the machine, you will think you are accomplishing extraordinary things, that you're having deep and fulfilling relationships, and that everyone admires and respects you. But you won't really be doing anything at all. In real life, you'll just be a person lying in a vat of water somewhere, being stimulated to believe that all these amazing things are happening. Now comes the question, would you go into the machine? Most people say that they wouldn't, and philosophers sometimes start with this basic thought and use it as part of an argument for the conclusion that there is more to life than just experiencing happiness, that there is something important about being connected up in the right way to reality. But de Brigard thought that maybe there was more to this story, so he conducted an experiment in which participants were given a case we might call the reverse experience machine. The reverse experience machine case goes like this. Imagine you are going about your ordinary life when one day you get a visit from a mysterious man named Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith explains to you that this whole life you think you've been leading, with all your supposed friends, your accomplishments, even your mother and father, is simply an illusion. A number of years ago, you encountered some super duper neuroscientists and they offered to put you into an experience machine where you would be stimulated to believe that you had exactly this life you think you've been having. Now you face a question. If you'd like, you can leave the machine and go back to your real life. Or, if you'd prefer, you can stay inside the machine and the neuroscientist will erase any memory you have of the visit from Smith. So think about it for a moment. What would you do? When Dave Brigard framed the thought experiment in this reversed way, he found that most people actually said they wanted to stay in the machine. So now it seems that we have learned something important about ourselves and that we might want to reevaluate the conclusion we drew from the original version. When we were just thinking about that original version, we had a particular intuition, and that intuition led us, as part of a complex philosophical argument, to arrive at a certain conclusion about what was truly important in life. But now it seems that we've acquired some new knowledge about the psychological processes that made us have that intuition in the first place. We learned that these processes aren't just sensitive to the difference between reality and illusion. They also leave us with a strong tendency to stick with whatever sort of life we've already got. So, now that you've learned this new fact about how people think, would you still arrive at the same conclusion from the experience machine thought experiment? So, when I see experiments like that, I'm like, ooh, you know, this is amazing. You know, I want to understand more about these things. I want to spend time thinking about these things. I like giving these experiments to people and seeing how they react to that sort of thing. So some, some really, um, I, I think, groundbreaking stuff, taking uh, philosophical thought experiments and then putting them to a social psychological experiment test. So you can go and read about this. So this is actually a journal that's called Philosophical Psychology. So it's a subsection let's say, of the larger psychology affiliated with social psychology uh, about uh, uh, Filippi over here that, that did this, uh, you know, experience, um, experience machine. Do you want to stay? Do you want to join? What happens to that? I'll uh, give you uh, one more person in this uh, movement, Edina Hmias. 
Um, let's listen to two sections, quick sections about him. Eddie, I love philosophy. Uh, I love the arguments, the analytical arguments that uh, go violently across many topics. But recently, this whole area of experimental philosophy is getting a lot of interest. You're one of the pioneers in the field. I'd like to understand how it works. Uh, and is there any real significance to it? Because I'm a bit of a skeptic. Yeah, yeah, uh, I am too sometimes. <laughs> so I started doing experimental philosophy with some of my students at Florida State, and we were just trying to test a very simple thing, whether or not philosophers are right when they say things like, well, ordinary people think free will is incompatible with determinism, or when you expose your students to determinism, they immediately think that's that rules out free will. And other philosophers, compatibilists, will say, no, you know, commonsensically, free will and determinism can, can work together. And so we thought, well, why don't we test it since they're making claims about what people actually say. And so we developed surveys where we explain determinism in the survey and we say that which is that every everything has a cause goes back as long as you want that's right and and we tried different ways of explaining it so in one you have a supercomputer we say imagine in the future we have a supercomputer that can knows all the laws of nature and if, if it can see what the universe is like at a particular time it can predict what will happen in the future okay and it predicts in 50 years before this guy is born uh that in another 50 years, he'll rob a bank at this particular time. As usual, the supercomputer, as always, the supercomputer is right. Um, and then the question is, is this guy free in robbing the bank? Did he have free will? And is he morally responsible? Is he blameworthy? And what we found is actually most people said yes. They didn't think that this deterministic universe ruled out free will. We tried it in other ways. Well, what if you had a universe that you rewind and run over and over Every time you start from the same initial conditions, the same laws of nature, the same thing happens as a deterministic universe would be. Would people have free will in that universe? Most people said yes. So we began to think maybe ordinary people aren't uh, afraid of determinism, as it were. Um, other people, like Josh Nob and Sean Nichols, have tried other experiments and gotten slightly conflicting results. So more recently, with one of my students, Dylan Murray, we tried to see, well, what exactly is going on here? And we designed questions to see how people are interpreting the deterministic scenarios. And some of the questions were things like, in this universe, do people's desires have any effect on what they end up doing? I've done many of these myself, trying to understand how people understand free will. Is this compatible with determinism? How does this impact all sorts of choices in, in life? So. Did, did a bunch of work in, uh, in that, worked with the social psychologists and some of the experimental philosophers. Fascinating uh, stuff. I'll just jump ahead to 605. Oh, no. and, and with experimental philosophy, we can try and figure out what psychological processes are leading people to think the things they think and why they might be making errors. So we can develop an error theory for mm. other people's philosophical beliefs. And in my case, I think I've got an error theory for people like you, libertarians about free will. Well, I, I certainly can use all the error correction <laughs> that you can come up with, that's for sure. Uh, but w what you're doing, though, would have real impact if it could help philosophers think. Is, is that a reality, or, or they'd be too arrogant to accept your uh, analysis? Well, I mean, we disagree uh, among ourselves, of course, but actually, uh, I found it very helpful in clarifying the issues in my own mind because if I have to try to set up surveys or experiments to ask ordinary people what they think about free will, I have to make sure that I'm making mm. it as clear as possible. And that often, often helps me sort of see what the issues are. Yeah, so this really summarizes my journey with experimental philosophy and the issues of free will. At the beginning, I had no idea what free will is. Every time I tried to think about this, it was very difficult for me to conceptualize this, but having to design surveys or experiments for participants and then seeing how they react and then revising has really helped my understanding of what these things are. So as you can see, this is uh, published in uh, Science, uh, Sean Nichols. Um, introduced experimental philosophy and in regards to the problem of, of free will. 
And the nice thing is that many of the people in experimental philosophy do care about methods. They do care about reproducibility and replicability. So they're very transparent about their scenarios. They do try and run replications. And for the most part, sorry, for the most part, just like with our replications in judgment decision making, experimental philosophy seems to replicate rather well. So because everything is transparent, everything is shared, and everything is quite simplified, then you can see that the replication rates are, are quite high. Many of the people um, um, included here, so here is Josh Nob. Like I know, I know many of these people, some of my collaborators are here. So it's really nice how they came together and did this mass replication effort for experimental uh, philosophy. Um, they did all sorts of analyses to try and see uh, if there's something that replicates better than others. So the replication rate for content based seems to be much higher than for context based or demographic effects. So the stuff that seems more personality related did not replicate as much, but the stuff that is content based, which is much of the experimental philosophy, seems to be highly replicable and with a, a relatively stronger uh, effect sizes. Um, let's see if we have time. Yeah. So maybe I'll just show you one of the experimental uh, philosophy paradigms, and with that, I think we'll try and end. So if you go and uh, use the, the code, you can read this or just uh, look at this together with me. I'll show you what the results were from previous semester, given the uh, limited amount of time. Actually, I'll, I'll read this together with you. So here's what we have. Actually, this effect, it's called the side effect effect, but because Joshua Nob. <laughs> The person who read the video that we, we saw is the person who introduced this. Actually, people refer to this as the Nob effect. So the Josh Nob effect says like this. We have two scenarios. You can do this in a between design or within design. It doesn't matter. Chairman A, the vice president of this company, went to the chairman of the board and said, we are thinking of starting a new program. It will help us increase profits and it will also help the environment. The chairman of the board answered, I don't care at all about helping the environment. I just want to make as much profit as I can. Let's start the program. They started a new program. Sure enough, the environment was helped. Do you agree with the following statement? The chairman should be applauded for his action if they led to positive outcome. Second scenario, very similar to that. But the difference is, is that uh, the vice president went and then it says it will help us increase profits, but will also harm the environment. And then sure enough, the environment was harmed. In this case, do you agree with the following statement? The chairman should be criticized for his actions if they led to negative outcomes. Yeah, so here we have the, the also help the environment and um, should it be praised? And then, so almost everything is equal. Just one is about positive and praise, and one is about negative and harm. And it seems like most of the people, when they uh, read this uh, sort of scenario, the way that they react to this is the following. So you can see, for example, when I ran this, uh, do you think uh, should be praised for a side effect of helping the environment? People said 2.2, not very much. But when there was negative outcomes as a side effect, People thought that definitely the chairman should be held accountable for this. Thank you. Yeah, so they thought that this is curious. Uh, experimental philosophers thought that this is, uh, like you said, <laughs> doesn't make a lot of sense because if somebody is to be held accountable, they should also get the praise for it if they did something that led to a positive positive outcome. And we've actually replicated this uh, many times in different scenarios. And we also did an interaction with free will. So we kind of uh, a deterministic universe, an indeterministic universe. And then we looked at the differences between harm and, um, and help. I know it's a little bit small, but this is like from in the papers, we did the, the fonts uh, too, too small. But these are like fun experiments. I just wanted to share a little bit uh, of that uh, with you. Another fun, interesting experiment is, um, where is this? Well, this is too long. But I just want to show you that um, this is a scenario of an accountant 
that has a severe head injury from a car accident. Um, and then it's the year 2049. So this is the far future. And uh, you're able to grow different parts of the brain if they become damaged. So a um, person went through a brain transplant and supposedly everything was supposed to be okay. But then you noticed that the patient lost something. And then the question is, if they lost this thing, are they still the same person? So in this one, uh, agnosia, so he lost the ability to recognize object, apathy, he lost uh, all his desires, no longer wants to, or desires anything, or lost the morality, lost his moral conscience, he's no longer capable of judging right from wrong. And then religion has lost his faith in God, he no, long, longer, no longer goes to church, no longer commits to religious activities. So if we see that the person has lost any one of these things, to what extent is the person still the same person? Which is something that we need to think about, you know, in medical settings, when we have more and more interventions doing all kinds of things. I think psychologists back in the 1940s and 50s did horrible, horrible things with electric shocks and the mental institutions, like really baffling uh, things that go against any kind of humanity. So whenever, whenever we do these interventions and a person changes something, is this still the same person? If a person takes antidepressants and suddenly has something, or has ADHD, supposedly diagnoses ADHD and takes ADHD medication and then changes something in his uh, behavior, his or her behavior, is this still the same person? How do we evaluate this? So this is a deeply philosophical question and we want to know how people think about this, right? So of the four things, ability to recognize objects, desires, morality or faith in God, which one is the strongest indication of a person not being himself anymore? So when we ask this to participants, so this is a class uh, replication that I did of this, and it does seem like uh, if a person, uh, you know, if somebody's morality changes, it seems like they've lost something very significant in their lives. A little bit more when it comes to religion, but much less so about recognizing uh, objects or having uh, desires. So the bottom line from this, so this is uh, once again, Sean Nichols and uh, Nina that uh, did this wonderful experiment, trying to look at um, what is the most core aspect of the self. And it does seem, and this is their uh, bottom line findings, is that the most essential part of the self seems to be morality. At least for us, in our lay beliefs, the way that we perceive the human is that morality seems to be one of the core principles, which takes us back to the first, second, third class of discussing morality. Why is morality so important? Why does the EA community discuss morality so much? So experimental philosophers trying to understand how important morality might be. And then I just want to say that one of the thesis students working with me, we ran a replication of this. Uh, so Samsung here. Uh, so originally they did agnosia, apathy, amnesia, and morality. And Samsung uh, was really interested to try and beat morality. So we wanted to see, can we get to something that will be more than morality? And I asked Samsung, what do you think about this? And he said, it has to be like ideology and religion. So we did extensions and we added religion and ideology, but still nobody can beat morality. <laughs> so we gave it our best shot to find things that if people lost them, people will say, this is no longer the same person, but morality seems to go beyond ideology, go beyond religion. So a very successful replication of the five categories, plus even with our two added uh, domains of ideology and religion, still morality prevails. Yeah, let's do one last uh, video from Josh Nog. Hi, I'm Josh Nog. I'm a professor at Yale University, and I'm going to be talking about the notion of a true self. So let's begin with a classic case of a conflict between belief and emotion. Imagine a man named Mark, who has a belief that homosexuality is a sin. So he thinks that it's more morally wrong for people to be with others of the same sex, and in fact, he travels the world preaching this message and teaching people techniques they can use 
to resist same-sex attraction. But now, imagine that Mark has a problem. Mark's problem is that he himself is actually gay. So on a kind of emotional, visceral level, he's drawn to be with other men. As a result, Mark is feeling a conflict between his beliefs and his emotions. And the question I want to ask now is, which of those two aspects of him is his true self? Which is the part that really reveals who he himself most truly is deep down inside? So here, different people might have different views. Some people might say, ultimately, your true self is constituted by your beliefs, by your reasoning, by your abstract thinking. So they might say, Mark's true self is a part of him that says that homosexuality is a sin. But then other people might have exactly the opposite view. They might say, your true self is constituted by your emotions, by your visceral desires, by your passions. And then they might say, Mark's true self is the part of him that's drawn toward being with another man. So I was talking about this question with two of my colleagues, George Newman and Paul Bloom. And we began thinking, maybe people's ordinary notion of the true self doesn't really fit with either of these two conceptions. Instead, maybe people's ordinary notion of the true self is shaped in a really fundamental way by their value judgments. So maybe when people are thinking about your true self, what they do is to think about which aspect of yourself is the valuable one, the good one, the one worth preserving. So to see whether this is right, we conducted an experimental study. One group of participants was just given the exact case of Mark that I just gave to you. But then we wanted to know whether people's value judgments affected people's answers to this question. So we recruited two different groups of participants, liberal participants and conservative participants. And what we found was a striking difference. So the conservative participants tended to say that Mark's belief was part of his true self, that his belief that homosexuality was morally wrong was in some sense the voice of his true self speaking to him. The liberals tended to say exactly the opposite. They said that that belief was not part of his true self and that his true self was actually constituted by his emotions or his desires or his passions, the part of him that was drawing him to be with another man. So looking just at that first result, you get at least some evidence that people's judgments about the true self are in some way shaped by their value judgments. But to see whether this is really true, we recruited a separate group of participants who received the reverse of that first case. So these group of participants were told about a person who believes that people of all sexual orientations should be treated equally. So he thinks that it's morally wrong to in any way discriminate against gay people. And in fact, he travels the world preaching this message and teaching people techniques they can use to resist their prejudice against homosexuals. However, this person has a problem. His problem is that he himself has these negative emotions toward gay people. So he himself finds himself feeling disgust toward homosexuals. And as a result, he also is faced with an inner conflict, a conflict between his beliefs and his emotions. Here too, we find a difference, but this time it's in the opposite direction as it were. So the liberal participants tend to say his belief that people of all sexual orientations should be treated equally, that is the voice of his true self speaking to him. By contrast, the conservative participants say that belief isn't his true self at all. His true self is revealed by this emotion he has, this disgust toward gay people. So looking now at the whole pattern of results, what we see is it's not that people always think that your beliefs are your true self, and it's not that people always think that your emotion is your true self. Rather, what seems to happen is that people pick out whichever part of you they regard as the good part, the valuable part, the part worth preserving. They think that that is your true self. But now, these experimental results leave us with a question at a more philosophical level. The question is, should we think of this fact about people's judgments as just showing a bias, or a distortion, a mistake they're making? Or should we think that it's actually revealing something fundamental about the very concept of a true self? Yeah, so really good stuff. I thought this was uh, fascinating when I read this uh, article. Uh, the demonstration about liberals versus conservatives, and just like generally, uh, the people tend to perceive uh, true self as something that's generally positive, which is why we did a replication of this uh, last year. So one of the thesis students and amazingly successful replication in almost every regard. So uh, this uh, worked beautifully with another really interesting extension. 
So this uh, group uh, with uh, Nob, Newman, Paul Bloom, Sean Nichols, uh, Eddie Namias, uh, really does some really groundbreaking stuff. Experimental philosophy, really helping us disentangle how people uh, think about uh, fundamental issues like uh, free will, morality, true self, so forth. Last video I want to show you is uh, from recently the, uh, the, the Daily Show. Uh, I think uh, uh, Trevor Noah is, is uh, quitting, so he's going to be replaced soon. But uh, here's Will from the Effective Altruism Movement, and I thought this was a brilliant, um, a brilliant interview. I'm just going to play for you the first two minutes. I strongly recommend that you take um, some time to watch the whole thing. I just wanted to show you that philosophers do things that are re related to social psychology and also related to have an impact on the world and regarding things like prediction, for forecasting, future, and general impact altogether. And with this, we're going to end. So it's beautiful how philosophers, experimental philosophers, take a very big question that we think that we can't answer and then give you a scenario that everybody can understand and relate to that kind of captures the essence of that moral dilemma, and then suddenly it becomes uh, very clear. So Will is a great thinker in the effective altruism movement. He's based in philosophy, moral philosophy, but he's also, of course, doing some world of good. So hopefully this kind of inspires you a little bit. Uh, experimental philosophy on the border of social psychology with long-termism and forecasting, to try and understand a little bit more about how we tie together all these things that we've been talking about in this course into one section of just trying to do the most good and, and trying to do this accurately uh, and impactfully.